Welcome to Holy Heartbeats. My name is Nathan, and I narrate Christ-centered testimonies from all over the world. These testimonies include rapture and end times visions, near-death experiences, encounters with angels and demons, God, Jesus, and even Satan himself. Please consider subscribing to my channel if you are fond of listening to these types of stories, and let me know what you think about these testimonies in the comments section below. Furthermore, for those who want to share their personal testimonies, visions, and revelations from God, you can send us your own stories at holyheartbeat7 at gmail.com. I will be very honored to read your testimony which may inspire, edify, and encourage a lot of people in their personal journey of faith with the Lord Jesus Christ. To all of my subscribers, I always try my best to read all of your precious comments, and I'm very grateful for your never-ending support. I pray for the Lord Jesus Christ to always protect you and keep you in perfect peace amidst the chaos in this world. Now, without any further delay, let's dive right into today's story. Delivered from the Powers of Darkness by Emmanuel Amos Chapter 3 The Wicked Rain The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. John chapter 10 verse 10 Upon my return to Lagos, I resumed my business activities. After two weeks, I made another journey to the sea. The queen of the coast assigned me what she called her first assignment. I was instructed to go to my village and kill my uncle, a prominent and powerful native doctor who she claimed was responsible for the death of my parents. I followed her instructions and journeyed to my village, but having never killed anyone before, I lacked the courage to commit murder. Instead, I chose to destroy his medicines and render him powerless. This act had significant consequences, as he lost all his customers and remained powerless up to the present day. When I returned to report to the Queen of the Coast, she was furious with me. She informed me that the penalty for disobeying her instructions was death, but she decided to spare my life due to her love for me. However, she ordered me to return to the same village and kill two elders who she claimed had aided in the killing of my parents. I was unsure whether this was a punishment for my disobedience or not, but I complied. Once back in the village, I managed to kill these two men and sent their blood to the Queen of the Coast. The mysterious circumstances surrounding their deaths prompted the village elders to consult another powerful native doctor who had the ability to send lightning to uncover the truth. In a strange encounter with this native doctor's spirit, I warned him not to reveal my involvement if he valued his life. Consequently, he emerged and advised the elders to go home and reconcile with one of their offended sons without mentioning my name. The lightning sent by the native doctor returned and struck in their midst, killing some and leaving many wounded. Following this first act, the powers within me began to manifest themselves. I used these powers to inflict harm, deforming a girl who rejected my advances, among other acts of cruelty. My Meeting with Satan Upon returning to Lagos, I continued my activities in the spiritual realm. One day a girl named Nina approached me. Nina's parents were from Anambra State, and she was a strikingly beautiful young girl who predominantly lived in the underwater spirit world. She served as a dedicated agent of the Queen of the Coast and harbored a deep hatred for Christians, going to great lengths to oppose Christianity. I had initially met her during one of my visits to the sea where she came on an errand from the Queen of the Coast, Nina and I quickly departed for the sea once again, and upon arrival we were informed of a conference with Lucifer himself. Satan, during this meeting, issued us specific instructions to target believers rather than unbelievers because the unbelievers were already under his influence. When questioned about this directive, Satan explained that God had banished him from that place. He consistently avoided using the word heaven throughout our meetings due to his pride and he was determined to prevent any Christians from entering that place. 
He emphasized that we should not engage in combat with hypocrites, as they were similar to him. Satan stressed that his time was drawing near, so we should intensify our efforts to ensure that no one entered that place. When one of our group mentioned that God had sent someone to rescue humanity and mentioned the name Jesus, Lucifer reacted strongly. He shouted at the individual and forbade the mention of that name in our meetings under the threat of severe consequences. It was evident that even Satan bowed to the name of Jesus, as the Bible says, At the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Philippians chapter 2 verse 10 After this incident, Lucifer assured us that he would soon come to rule the world and promised us, his agents, a better position to avoid suffering with the rest of the world. He declared his intent to manipulate humanity by creating distractions such as wealth, money, and women to divert their attention from God and weaken the church. Satan outlined these three factors as the means to destroy the church. 1. Money. 2. Wealth. 3. Women. After Satan's speech and the conclusion of the meeting, I had my first meeting with Satan. Subsequently, I had several more meetings with him. As we were leaving the meeting, the Queen of the Coast, who could appear in various forms, invited me to her mansion. She placed human ashes, among other substances, inside the bones of my two legs, inserted a special stone, not an ordinary one, into my finger, and concealed something else inside the bone of my right hand. Each of these items had specific purposes. 1. The stone in my finger allowed me to discern the thoughts of anyone harboring ill intentions towards me. 2. The object in my right hand empowered me to destroy. 3. The items in my legs were meant to make me more resilient and dangerous, enabling me to transform into various forms including those of a woman, beast, bird, cat, and others. Additionally, the Queen of the Coast provided me with a telescope, a television, and a video camera. These were not ordinary devices, but were intended for detecting born-again Christians and churchgoers within the church. Furthermore, she assigned 16 girls to work as my agents, and among them was Nina. I returned to Lagos armed with these gifts and continued my dark journey transformed into Satan's agent. I had become devoid of any human emotions or compassion in my heart. I swiftly embarked on my mission, obliterating five duplexes simultaneously, causing them to vanish into the earth, along with their inhabitants. This occurred in Lagos during August 1982. The blame fell upon the contractor for neglecting the construction's foundation, and the price he paid was steep. Many of the calamities unfolding in the world today are not of human origin. The devil's sole purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. I reiterate, Satan offers no free gifts. I engaged in orchestrating accidents on the roads and beyond. Allow me to recount an incident involving a recently converted individual who enthusiastically shared his salvation and deliverance testimony. His actions wreaked havoc in the spiritual realm, so I devised a plan to orchestrate an accident for him. One fateful day, he boarded a luxurious bus bound for Lagos, where he was scheduled to testify. As the bus hurtled at high speed, I swerved it off the road, causing it to collide with a tree. Tragically, all passengers perished, except for the young convert. His survival was nothing short of miraculous. He emerged from the wreckage through the bus's trunk, exclaiming, I am safe! I am safe! Our attempts to deter him from testifying proved futile. Through television, we identified newly repentant individuals and relentlessly pursued them, hoping to lead them astray. If, after six months, our efforts failed, we would target their businesses, driving them to financial ruin. For civil servants, we exerted influence through their superiors, even leading to their termination if possible. Should an individual remain steadfast in their faith, we abandoned our pursuit. However, if they backslid, they met a dire fate to ensure they had no chance of repentance. My actions caused such devastation that Lucifer himself was pleased and appointed me as the chairman of the wizards. Within a month of my chairmanship, a meeting was convened. We attended this assembly in the forms of birds, cats, and snakes. These transformations served various purposes. 1. Assuming the form of birds amplified the malevolence of wizards. 2. Transforming into cats allowed wizards to interact with both spirits and humans. 3. Morphing into rats facilitated easy entry into homes, followed by a transformation into shadows during the night, allowing them to take on a human guise and feed on their victim's blood. 
During that pivotal meeting, our sole agenda was the Christians. We proceeded to plan an African wizard conference to be held in Benin City in 1983. We advertised it extensively in newspapers and across all public media outlets. We rallied all the forces of darkness, exuding confidence that nothing could disrupt our meticulously crafted plans. We believed there were no vulnerabilities in our strategy. Then, unexpectedly, the Christians in Nigeria began fervent prayers and praises to their Almighty God, shattering all our plans. Not only did our schemes crumble, but also the kingdom of darkness was thrown into disarray. Consequently, the Witches and Wizards Conference could not take place in Nigeria. It's crucial for Christians to recognize that when they engage in genuine worship and praise to God, it unleashes turmoil and confusion in both the spiritual and earthly realms, rendering Satan's agents restless. Prayer is akin to detonating a time bomb within our midst, compelling everyone to flee for their lives. If Christians would only realize and wield the power and authority bestowed upon them by God, they could govern the affairs of their nation. It is only Christians who can save our nation. Following the conference's failure, which was later held in South Africa, I was summoned back to the sea. Upon my arrival, I was informed that henceforth the sea would be my home, and I would only visit the earthly realm for challenging assignments. I was assigned a new role, creating charms for native doctors, overseeing the control room, and bestowing gifts, which included the establishment of white garment churches, prayer houses, maternity clinics, successful stores, and granting individuals children and money. These aspects will be elaborated upon individually. 1. Opening of White Garment Churches When an individual sought our assistance to construct a prayer house and perform healing rituals, they were required to adhere to specific conditions. A. They had to commit to offering us one or two souls each year. B. At a certain level of leadership within the church, the person would be initiated into our secret society. C. Congregants were prohibited from entering the prayer house wearing shoes. When an individual accepted these conditions, they would receive a package containing items like white gravel, human bones, blood, and charms, all enclosed within a native pot. They were instructed to bury this pot, along with its contents, in front of the church, leaving only the cross visible above the ground. They were also advised to construct a pool, or keep a basin where spirits would continuously supply special water, commonly referred to as holy water. Many people troubled by evil spirits would seek out these prophets in hopes of exercising them. However, the reality was that these prophets only added more demons to their affliction. A devil cannot cast out another devil. Luke chapter 11 verses 17 to 19. The prophet's typical response was to pray for the member and provide them with a red cloth to place in their home, along with the recommendation to pray with candles and incense. Through these actions, the person unwittingly invited us into their household. Sometimes, the member would be instructed to offer sacrifices, such as a goat, as a means to seek our assistance in curing them. The prophet possessed no inherent power to heal or cure. 2. Opening of Maternities For a woman seeking assistance in establishing a maternity and ensuring its success, a condition would be presented. A month chosen by us will see the death of all children born in the maternity while in other months, the children will survive. If she agreed, she would be given a charm that attracted people to the maternity. Such maternities existed in places like Onicha and Lagos, and they strictly prohibited the entry of shoes. 3. Opening of Fancy Stores When a man approached us for assistance in launching a fancy store, he would receive a ring with the condition that no woman should touch it, and he must agree to become our member. If he accepted these conditions, his store would consistently be stocked with the finest and latest merchandise, courtesy of our influence. 4. Granting of Children If a barren woman sought help from certain native doctors, she would be instructed to provide a white cock, a goat, native chalk, and baby care items after sharing her grievances. In her absence, the native doctor would approach us, delivering these items. We would then concoct a mixture, including human ashes and other inexplicable ingredients. The doctor would use this charm to prepare food for the woman, leading to her pregnancy and childbirth. However, the child born under these circumstances was not a normal human being. If the child was female, she would live and even get married, but remain barren throughout her life. If the child was male, he would live and receive training only to die suddenly, never surviving to bury his parents. 
It's worth noting that barrenness is often attributed to demonic influences. While a woman may be barren on earth, she might have children in the sea. Therefore, I advise God's children to rely solely on God, as only He grants genuine children. 5. Provision of Wealth When a man approached us seeking wealth, he would be presented with the following conditions. He would be asked to offer a part of his body, or, if he had a family, his son would be demanded. If he was single, he would be instructed to bring his elder or younger brother. The person brought had to be from the same womb. During the sacrificial ritual, the individual who brought the victim would be given a spear or arrow. The victim's relatives would pass by a mirror, and as soon as the chosen individual's reflection appeared, they would be instructed to strike, causing the victim to die instantly at their location. Indeed, it's a chilling aspect of these dark practices that Satan ensures the donor becomes responsible for the death of the victim. This manipulation serves as a grim reminder that in dealings with the forces of darkness, there are no free gifts. Every pact and action come at a devastating cost. It underscores the treacherous and malevolent nature of such engagements, reinforcing the importance of resisting the temptations and deceptions propagated by these evil forces. Chapter 4 How Satan Fights Christians Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 to 12 Fighting Christians after Lucifer commanded us to fight the Christians, we convened to devise strategies for our battle, which included the following tactics. 1. Inflicting illnesses. 2. Inducing infertility. 3. Inducing drowsiness within the church. 4. Sowing discord within the church. 5. Encouraging spiritual apathy within the church. 6. Keeping them ignorant of God's word. 7. Exploiting fashion and rivalry. 8. Engaging in physical confrontations. Among these, I would like to elaborate on two specific methods. 1. Physical Confrontation I was entrusted with a television to monitor born-again Christians. We did not bother with hypocrites since they were already under our influence. Instead, we dispatched our female agents to prominent churches. Inside the church, they would engage in distracting behaviors such as chewing gum, making children cry, or any disruptive activity to divert the congregation's attention from the Word of God. They could also employ spiritual means to induce drowsiness during sermons. If they noticed someone deeply affected by the preaching, they would approach them outside the church, feigning friendliness, and even offering carefully chosen gifts. These agents would gradually befriend the individual, eroding their faith until they forgot what they had learned in church. In the case of a genuine Christian, one of these agents would initiate contact, claiming to be new in town and seeking Christian companionship. After visiting the Christian's home and offering gifts like bananas, the agent would continue the visits until the Christian's spiritual light was extinguished, and then cease contact. Our primary objectives within active churches and fellowships included discouraging Christians from reading and studying the Word of God, leading them into ignorance regarding their spiritual authority and God's promises. In crusades and gatherings, our agents were dispatched to incite disputes and arguments. How to Identify Christians Genuine Christians are not recognized solely by the Bible they carry or the number of fellowships they attend. In the spiritual realm, they are distinguished by a constant radiant light akin to a brilliant candle within their hearts, a luminous halo around their heads, or an encircling wall of fire. When a Christian walks, angels accompany them, one on their right, one on their left, and one behind, shielding them from our reach. Our only means of success is to lead them into sin, thereby creating an opening for us to infiltrate their lives. When a Christian is driving, we find they are never alone in the car, always accompanied by an angel. If only Christians comprehended the full extent of God's blessings, they would refrain from sin and live with vigilance. 2. The Making of Backslidden Christians In my role as the appointed chairman for Lucifer, I would dispatch these deceptive agents to thriving churches and fellowships. These agents, elegantly dressed, would attend the church service, respond to the altar call, and pretend to have embraced Christianity. Afterward, they would linger, 
waiting for the preacher who naturally would be delighted with these apparent conversions. These new converts might even accompany the preacher to his home. If the preacher lacked discernment, they would attempt to lure him into the sins of fornication or adultery, capitalizing on any lustful desires he displayed. They would ensure he continued in these sins until they succeeded in extinguishing the Spirit of God within him, after which they would depart, their mission accomplished. At this point, I would like to share the story of a minister who was renowned as a man of God in the evil spirit world. When he knelt in prayer, it caused turmoil among us. Consequently, we sent these agents to him, and despite their efforts, they could not seduce him. In fact, they were killed for their failure. I then transformed into a woman and attempted to entice him through words and actions, but he remained resolute. This posed a significant challenge for me, so I decided to attempt his physical destruction. One day, when the minister was at the Oduekbe Road market town, I observed him as he bent down to bargain for some goods. I directed an approaching trailer loaded with drums of oil into the market, causing it to collide with a Nipah high-tension pole. Many people perished, but the minister miraculously escaped. On another occasion, I saw him traveling on foot to Ankpor town. Once again, I directed an approaching army lorry loaded with yams toward him, hoping to end his life. The lorry veered off the road, causing casualties, but the minister miraculously survived. After this second failed attempt, I abandoned my efforts. He remains alive to this day. The devil may seek to destroy many souls for the sake of a single Christian, believing he can eliminate them, but he consistently fails. Many Christians are unaware of such incidents, but their God always delivers them. The devil, however, does not relent. His persistent thought is, I may succeed, though he never does. As long as a Christian walks in God's love, abides in him, and avoids entanglement with the affairs of this world, the devil cannot succeed, regardless of his relentless efforts. Only unbelievers are susceptible to his influence. The Oppression of Christians This oppression predominantly occurs in dreams where a Christian may experience the following. 1. A deceased relative visiting them. 2. Pursuit by masquerades. 3. Friends swimming in a river. 4. Friends offering food and urging them to eat. 5. A single woman engaging in sexual activity or even a married woman having intercourse with a man, which, if left unaddressed, can lead to barrenness. Additionally, a pregnant woman may dream of engaging in sexual activity with a man, which, if not promptly addressed, can result in a miscarriage. If a Christian encounters the experiences mentioned in their dreams, it is crucial not to dismiss them casually. Instead, upon waking, the individual should engage in the following steps. 1. Self-examination. Reflect on your life and conduct a thorough self-examination. Confess any known sins or transgressions to God. Repentance and seeking forgiveness are essential steps in maintaining a strong spiritual connection. 2. Prayer and spiritual warfare. Bind and rebuke any demonic influences or entities that may have been involved in the dream experiences. Call upon the power of God to protect and cleanse you from any negative spiritual influences. 3. Seek restoration. Pray to God for restoration. Ask Him to repair any damage or disruption that may have occurred as a result of these dreams. Trust in His ability to restore your spiritual well-being. 4. Seek counsel. It's wise to seek the counsel of a mature, spirit-filled Christian who has experience and wisdom in matters of faith and spiritual warfare. They can provide guidance, support, and prayer during times of spiritual testing and struggle. Remember that dreams can be a realm where spiritual battles manifest, and addressing them with faith, repentance, and seeking help from fellow believers is an important part of maintaining a strong and protected spiritual life. The Devil's Soul Winning When Jesus Christ was leaving this earth, he gave his disciples a powerful command, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. While certain Christians may be deferring their compliance, the devil has similarly issued this directive to his followers. The notable distinction lies in the fact that the devil's agents exhibit a greater determination to convert souls compared to some Christians. One specific realm where the devil's efforts in soul conversion are particularly conspicuous is within secondary schools, particularly those attended by girls. In this strategy, some of our female agents are placed as students within these schools. 
We equip them with the latest and most luxurious undergarments as a top priority, given that in girls' dormitories, underwear appears to be the preferred attire. Our agents are furnished with everything they need, including cosmetics, clothing, underwear, books, provisions, and money. Furthermore, these agents are equipped with a particular brand of bathing soap, which they generously share with other students upon request. This act of generosity and the allure of our well-supplied agents draw other girls towards them, leading to friendships. Gradually, our agents introduce these individuals to our cause, and at this point, we establish physical contact, providing them with gifts and meeting their needs. Through this process, they willingly join our ranks, and in turn, they are motivated to recruit others. This mission is pursued with unwavering determination. It's important to clarify that Satan does not force anyone to follow him. Instead, he lures individuals towards him willingly. This aligns with the biblical teaching, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. James chapter 4 verse 7 Another method employed in Satan's strategy for soul winning is the practice of offering rides to individuals. We dispatch our female agents to stand along roadways, often dressed attractively and exuding beauty. They can also be found in hotels. Through these avenues, we target both men and women. It's worth noting that many individuals reported missing in newspapers fell victim to giving rides to unfamiliar girls. Therefore, it is crucial to exercise caution when offering rides to unfamiliar individuals in your car. Chapter 5 My Encounter with Jesus Christ In February 1985, during our routine sea gathering, I made the decision to journey to Port Harcourt in Rivers State to pay a visit to my deceased uncle's wife. While there, I crossed paths with a man named Anthony who operated a workshop at Nwaja Junction along Transamati Road in Port Harcourt, River State. He extended an invitation to me, and in accordance with our societal code of never refusing such summons, I accepted. One Thursday afternoon that week, I went to meet him. Upon our meeting, Anthony informed me that he had received a message from God for me. He opened his Bible and began to preach. Three other individuals, fellow Christians consisting of a man and two women, were also present. His sermon lasted for an extended period, and I couldn't be certain that I absorbed everything he said. Eventually, he requested that I kneel for prayer, which I obediently did. As he commenced his prayers, a powerful spiritual experience overcame me, causing me to collapse to the ground. I struggled to my feet, and in my altered state, I inadvertently damaged some iron chairs within the workshop. Glancing outside, I noticed three fellow members of our secret society, a man and two women, attempting to approach the door in human form. However, due to the divine power at work, they were unable to enter. I am convinced that the alarms in the sea had alerted them to the predicament, and they had dispatched a rescue team that proved ineffectual due to the prevailing divine intervention. Such events typically unfolded whenever a member encountered trouble. While the two Christian men helped me back onto my knees, the two women continued fervently praying and binding the malevolent forces, although they refrained from specifying them. They inquired about my faith in Jesus Christ, to which I remained silent. They urged me to call upon the name of Jesus, a request I declined. When they asked for my name, I provided it. Hours passed in their struggle, but ultimately, they released me without having expelled any spirits from me. Thus, I departed in the same manner as I had arrived. The Church Events on the following Friday, Anthony once again invited me to join their night vigil at the Assemblies of God Church, Silver Valley, Port Harcourt. I accepted the invitation, as attending church services with the intent to disrupt and sow confusion was part of our covert assignments. The evening began with hymns and choruses, with everyone singing along. At one point, a member introduced a well-known chorus by a Christian band, emphasizing the supremacy of Jesus' power over all other forces. I found myself laughing during this moment. My laughter was prompted by my spiritual insight, which revealed that nearly three-quarters of the individuals singing this chorus were living in sin. I knew that their sinful lifestyles made them vulnerable to harm from these other powers they were singing about. It underscored the importance of Christians obeying the Word of God and addressing their besetting sins. In such services, it's crucial to encourage members to confess their sins first and then engage in sincere praise to God. This approach would make any agent of Satan in attendance uncomfortable and likely lead them to leave. 
During this particular service, my fellow C associates and I were quite comfortable and even began to operate spiritually. Many attendees started to fall asleep and the singing grew weaker and disjointed. Brother Anthony had already informed them about my presence, so around 2 a.m., they called me to the front for prayer. As I stepped forward, they began invoking the blood of Jesus. I stopped them and said, Pleading the blood is not the solution. I am deeply involved in a secret society. If you believe you can deliver me, then I will kneel down. These words were not premeditated. The blood of Jesus indeed scares demons and protects believers, but it doesn't bind demons. The binding of demons occurs when a Christian exercises their authority and commands them. They agreed, and I knelt down. At that moment, a sister, moved by the Spirit of God, shouted, If you are not worthy, do not come near! I'm sure many didn't fully grasp her meaning. It's dangerous for a Christian living in sin to attempt to cast out demons. Several people withdrew, and a few came forward to pray for me. As they began with, In Jesus' name, I heard a loud bang within me and collapsed to the floor. Immediately, a flying demon within me became active. Anyone possessed by this type of demon is exceedingly wicked and dangerous. Spiritually, I was running due to the intense spiritual power in the room. Two opposing spiritual forces engaged in a struggle, and the atmosphere changed dramatically. I suddenly stood up and became extremely violent. A demon exited me and possessed a young boy among the congregation, who began to fight the others, attempting to rescue me. The brethren wasted no time, and, along with those who were fearful, ushered him and the others into the church vestry, locking them inside. This continued until 7 a.m. I was physically drained and grew quiet, prompting the brethren to gather around me again, shouting, Name them! Who are they? I remained silent. After waiting for a considerable time without any response from me, they were deceived into thinking I had been delivered. They prayed, and we were dismissed. I was physically weakened and had difficulty walking out of the church. However, as soon as I crossed the road, something changed. I suddenly felt physically strong again. Perhaps some of the demons that had left me had returned. I grew intensely angry and decided to seek vengeance against the church, feeling insulted by the experience. I resolved to return to Lagos, gather more power, and join forces with others as wicked as myself. Then, I planned to return to Port Harcourt to exact vengeance on all the members of the Assembly of God, Silver Valley. En route to Lagos Upon reaching my late uncle's wife's house, I announced my immediate departure for Lagos and remained resolute despite their attempts to persuade me otherwise. I hailed a taxi to the Mile 3 motor park from where I planned to catch a ride to Onicha. My intention was to make a brief stop in Onicha to visit a friend before continuing my journey to Lagos. As we set off from Mile 3, on our way to Omagwe at the International Airport Junction, I heard a voice calling my native name, Akem. I turned to check if there was a familiar face in the taxi, but to my surprise, there was no one I recognized. The voice had an eerie familiarity, because only my late mother used to call me by that name. Everyone else, including the spirit world, knew me as Emmanuel. While I pondered this mysterious voice, it persisted, asking, Kem, are you going to betray me again? I couldn't identify the source of the voice, but it kept repeating the question, Are you going to betray me again? Suddenly, I was overcome by a severe fever, and the heat radiating from my body became so intense that the other passengers noticed. One of them asked if I had been well before the trip, and I assured them that I had been perfectly healthy and had not even experienced a headache before leaving Port Harcourt. In Umuakpa, Oweri, I collapsed inside the taxi. When I regained consciousness, two tall and imposing men appeared, one on my left and the other on my right. They didn't utter a word to me. Together, they led me along a rugged path strewn with glass shards and sharp metal objects. As we moved, the glass and metal inflicted painful cuts on me, and I began to cry, but the men remained silent. We eventually reached an express road, where one of them finally spoke, declaring, You are a wanted man. We continued until we arrived at an enormous, elongated building that resembled a conference hall. Once we ascended the steps, a voice from inside instructed, Take him in! The two men led me inside and then mysteriously vanished, leaving me alone. Describing what I encountered inside this hall is a challenge, but I will attempt to convey as much as possible. 
The hall was lavishly decorated and so expansive and elongated that it was difficult to discern its far end. I walked towards the center of the hall and could finally see the altar at the far end. On the altar, I observed a depiction of the moon and stars surrounding the sun. Seated upon a throne was an extraordinarily handsome figure clothed in a radiant garment that gleamed like the sun itself. He beckoned me, saying, Come. However, his brilliance was so intense that each time I attempted to move a step, I fell. Struggling to my feet, I made another attempt but fell once more. Suddenly a moon emerged from the throne where the figure sat and ascended to the ceiling above me. From the moon, two hands extended, grasped my head, shook me, and my physical body slipped away like removing a piece of clothing. The true essence of me stood revealed. The hands carefully folded my physical form, akin to folding a piece of fabric, and placed it in a corner. Subsequently, the moon returned to its place at the throne, and the figure on the throne spoke again, saying, Come. The Spiritual Cleansing I walked to a designated spot, and the figure on the throne descended to meet me. He began to remove my legs, one after the other, and poured out what was contained within them before reattaching them. He repeated this process with my hands, addressing the places where the Queen of the Coast had stored her powers. I marveled silently, wondering who this being was and how he knew the exact locations of these hidden powers. After completing this transformation, he returned to his throne and instructed me to approach. As I began to walk toward the altar, various objects began to fall from my body, scales fell from my eyes, and a profound transformation was underway. However, this transformation halted before I reached the altar. The figure inquired, Where are you going? I replied, I am going to Onitsha to see a friend. He acknowledged my response and then declared, Yes, but I will show you what you have in your mind. At this point I still did not know his identity, but one thing was unmistakable. He possessed power that eclipsed all the powers I had encountered before. He summoned a man who was tasked with revealing my innermost thoughts. This man escorted me to a room where what appeared to be a blackboard was displayed. If there had been a means of escape, I might have attempted it. Before me, everything I had schemed against Christians and my malevolent plans targeting the Assemblies of God Church, Silver Valley, were meticulously inscribed. The man returned me to the altar and departed. The figure on the throne emerged once more and took me by the hand, informing me that he intended to show me certain things. Along the way, he spoke of his desire for my salvation, emphasizing that this was my final opportunity. He warned that if I failed to repent and serve him, I would face death. He expressed his intention to reveal both the dwelling places of the saved and the fate awaiting the disobedient. At that moment, I recognized him as Jesus Christ. The Divine Revelations We entered another room, and he opened a curtain once more. In front of me, I saw the entire world, with people engaged in various activities, both Christians and unbelievers, each occupied with their pursuits. We proceeded to a second room, and as he drew back the curtain, I witnessed a heart-wrenching scene. People were bound in chains, and he referred to them as the hypocrites. These individuals appeared utterly despondent, and he explained that they would remain in this state until the Judgment Day. Our journey led us into a third room, and upon the unveiling of yet another curtain, I beheld a multitude of people rejoicing, all adorned in radiant white garments. This time I inquired, Who are these? He replied, These are the redeemed, awaiting their rewards. Moving on to a fourth room, the sight that greeted me was truly terrifying. Dear reader, Words failed to convey the horror I witnessed. It resembled an entire city engulfed in flames. Hell is real, and it is a dreadful place. This place is prepared for Satan, his angels, and the disobedient. He enumerated them as described in Revelation chapter 21 verse 8. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. In a fifth room, when he pulled back the curtain, what I saw can only be described as magnificent. It was as if we were viewing it from the summit of a mountain. I saw a new city, vast, resplendent, and indescribably beautiful. 
Its streets were paved with pure gold, and its architecture surpassed anything in this world. He explained, This is the hope of the saints. Will you be there? Without hesitation, I replied, Yes. Following this, we returned to the throne, where he instructed me, Go and testify to what I have done for you. He then led me to another room, unveiling a curtain to reveal the events that would transpire during my journey to Onitsha and Lagos, culminating in his final deliverance of me. Afterward, he reassured me, saying, Do not be afraid, go, I will be with you. He guided me out of the hall, and suddenly, he vanished. I awoke on a bed in another person's house, and I cried out. The man and his wife rushed in, having heard my shout. They had initially peered in from a distance and then entered. I inquired, Why am I here? The man proceeded to recount how I had collapsed in a taxi, and they had transported me to the Catholic Cathedral in Oweri. A doctor was summoned, who, after examining me, assured them that my pulse was normal and advised them to wait and observe. The doctor had given them the assurance that I would recover. The man then conveyed me to his home in his car and had been waiting there. He admitted that he couldn't explain why he had faith in the doctor's prognosis or why he had taken it upon himself to shelter me. They inquired about my name and address, to which I provided honest answers. Nevertheless, I remained reticent and did not share my extraordinary experience with them. I stayed peacefully with this kind family for two days, after which the man and his wife drove me to the Oweri Motor Park. There, I boarded a taxi headed for Onicha. Remarkably, every aspect of the journey unfolded just as the Lord had shown me. The next morning, I took another taxi to Lagos. I followed the Lord's instructions obediently and eventually departed Lagos for Port Harcourt. I often find myself pondering why the Lord would choose to save someone like me, an individual so wicked and destructive, an agent of Satan. The answer, I have come to realize, lies in these three words. God is love. Truly, God is love. May the grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with all of you who have him as your Savior. Dear friends, we will be sharing the continuation of Emmanuel Amos's amazing testimony in our next video. I have learned so much from these chapters. We as Christians should always be vigilant and put on the full armor of God so we can always stand and thwart the attacks of the enemy. We must also learn spiritual warfare and fully rely on Jesus because he is our only hope and refuge in this life. What about you? What are the important lessons you have learned from this video? Please let me know in the comments section below. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching. Stay safe, and I'll see you in our next video.